Good morning, my name is Caroline Merton and I work for AFSA as a scientific officer and I'm managing uh, mostly all of the projects in relation with uncertainty. Uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker of this conference, Professor Carl Teigen. He's an emeritus professor at the Department of Psychology at the University of Oslo. And uh, his, his research mainly focuses on uh, psychology, judgment, decision making, and he has led a uh, project on uncertainty communication and climate change. Welcome, Professor Teigen. Thank you, Caroline. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to be invited to this conference and have a chance to address so many experts on risk and uncertainties. I wondered what to share with you that you did not already know better than me. Uh, and it occurred to me that perhaps you uh, <clears throat> sometimes know so much about the scientific and technical aspects that you forget, or we forget, the pragmatic implications, what I call here the sense of, um, of the words and numbers used. Uh, there are many ways of making sense of uncertainty. Okay? Uh, you use words, you use graphs, you, you use numbers, and I have selected two from my own research my examples may be a little bit odd to you because uh, they are colored by our recent research project that Carlin mentioned, uh, namely on communication of uncertainty in the context of climate change. Uh, but I think it applies to risks and uncertainties in many other fields as well. Okay, so the two ways that we have studied in particular are verbal expressions of probability. Here is an example. We say it's likely that global temperatures will increase, or we say it's uncertain, or we say whatever. Uh, and the second one is uncertainty intervals, or ranges, like when I say that global temperatures will increase with two to five degrees. Both of these give factual information maybe neutral information about what to expect. But also, they give something else. They give some additional pragmatic information about what to think and what to decide. So this talk reports findings about what I call pragmatic information. Pragmatics now I'm using more or less like linguists use with talking about <coughs> the use of language and not just what the language mean literally. Okay, I will take these two in turn, and let's say something to begin with about verbal expressions of probability that are supposed to, at least among scientists, to, to uh, give some probabilistic information. Uh, there are many ways of uh, uh, focusing on this, and you know per perhaps the kind of prescriptive translations. People try to give schemes that sort of me show what should I mean when I'm saying something is very likely or something is very unlikely. And you have them, for instance, in the EFSA documents. Uh, you have seen this uh, maybe table before, uh, which is also recommended, or it is taken probably from the one recommended by the International Panel of Climate Change. The problem with these uh, words or these translations is that we can also use another approach. Instead of just deciding what to think about them, we can ask people. We can try to figure out what people mean. We can ask people, what do you mean by likely? What do you mean by uncertain, etc.? And we have done a lot of that. Psychologists have done a lot of it. The problem is that these translations do not always match. Uh, I have no t t time to go into what matches and what doesn't match, but they don't match. Trust me. Uh, 
And what is worse, we can't just switch to what people say they mean because people's translations diverge from each other. And they diverge more from each other than you think they do. So that may be the main problem here. So, so the conclusion, the kind of temporary conclusion on this is that verbal phrases are vague. That is the reputation they have. They have. Now let's look a little bit about their pragmatic function. And I will start with something I call hedging, with a quotation from Montaigne 450 years ago. He said, I, I love these words or phrases which mollify and moderate the boldness of our propositions. It may be, perhaps, in some sort, some, it is said, I think, and such like. How could he love them if they are so vague? I think he emphasized particularly their vagueness function in one way, and that we should be modest and maybe polite about our claims in the fields of knowledge. But I have a more specific pragmatic function in view, and that is the one we have called directionality which means that these words point in some direction, in actually in two different directions. So most of the terms we use are positive. They are affirmative. They point to the occurrence of something. We are not sure about it, but it points to it. And here is a selection of these, like certain, maybe on the top, a hope, maybe on the bottom, and something in between, you will see that uh, I, I have put here also will happen and can happen in this column, and a risk. Well, a risk is not positive in an effective or evaluative sense, but it still points to a target that can happen. And a way of finding out what it points to is to ask people to explain, like for instance, uh, it is, it's a risk that we will miss the flight. Why? Because of the traffic jam, okay? And if you ask other question like, it's very likely that we miss the flight, you get exactly the same explanation. Why? Because of the traffic jam. So what else is there? There are also phrases that include negations. They point to the opposite side of the coin, so to speak, to the non-occurrence of a target outcomes. And that is expressions like these. Not quite certain, somewhat uncertain, quite uncertain, doubtful, unlikely, improbable, and so on. And if you are going to explain why is it not quite certain that we will miss the flight, you will give some, get some other reasons, like maybe the flight is delayed too. This is not vague. The direction is usually very obvious to people. And as I said, the directionality is revealed by giving these positive and negative reasons. When are they chosen? You may think that, OK, positive for high probabilities, negative for low probabilities. Yes, partly, but that's not the whole story. It's better to say that it is positive for probabilities above some reference point and negative for probabilities below some reference point. And now it is important who is providing us with reference points. They may be decided by our expectations, some prior probabilities, somebody else said something about the probabilities and we have to reduce it or increase it statements made by others, and also revisions. Things are going upwards, then we will say likely. Let's say we have a probability of 60 or something, and before it was lower, so no, I will say it's likely. If before it was higher and it is reduced, I will now say it is uncertain. It's not completely certain, something negative. So the interesting thing about this 
phrases and this, uh, po this choice of positive and negative is that they say something about what you think about the speaker's attitudes and maybe even preferences. It's sort of revealing. And they also influence the decisions made by people who listen to you. Just to take one example, let's think of a probability of some treatment, medical treatment, whatever, which has a 30, 40% chance of being successful. And one doctor may say, it's quite possible it will help. And hearing that, a number of people will say, well, let's try it. But he may also say, it's not quite certain, or it's quite uncertain it will help, and have the same probability in mind. And then automatically, people will take it as an advice that they shouldn't try. Now, there is one particular word that we have studied a lot because it is our favorite because it's, so, uh, it's used in a number of on occasions and it seems to be people's favorite as well. Uh, because if you ask people about risks uh, of uh, substances or activities or whatever, they are saying a lot about what can happen. And we try to figure out what, what do they mean by that. And the most concrete example is here. We have showed in the world of climate change, we have showed people these kind of projections on future temperatures or future sea level rise. And in the last example, you see also that there are some, uh, uh, some uncertainty ranges around these uh, temperatures from are these uh, sea levels from, from different, uh, uh, different computations and different institutes, etc. Well, if we ask, if we show this to people and say, what, what do you think will happen? Uh, what is most likely? Most likely. Then most people will choose something in between, in the middle, which is quite sensible. But if I ask people to fill in sentences like that, what can happen? It can be how many degrees warmer? The sea level may or could or can be how much higher than today? A curious finding emerged, and I think you already have a feeling of that. What would you put in? Well, people put in the topmost value. They go to the top. They say five degrees. They say one meter. And the interesting thing is, of course, that they are selecting a, a value that is uh, not just quite extreme, but also quite unlikely. So we call this the extremity effect. And they use it also with possible. And I wouldn't be surprised by, what would you be surprised by? People fill it in with the topmost value. For some strange reason, they will not be surprised by the topmost value. They could, perhaps had taken the bottom value, but I don't. And I don't know exactly why. Uh, the problem is that if you only have this com last communication, you, you hear or you read in the newspaper what can happen, you think that is quite likely. Or many people think it's quite likely. So they use it for something extreme that is rather rare but there is, they receive it as a much more likely statement. OK. I will also say something about the second topic, uncertainty, range intervals or ranges. And you know that these ranges are not uh, dichotomous. It's not like it will happen within this range or it will not happen in this range. If we say, for instance, a two to five degrees increase in future temperatures, we mean that this is also a kind of probabilistic statement because you have to be 90% certain or 95% certain or something like that. Uh, and you as scientists and mathematicians, you know that if you are really going to be sure, then you should have a very, very wide 
confidence interval. And in more narrow interval, the more likely you will miss a true value. So high certainty requires wide intervals. But this is not evident to everybody because narrow intervals also give a kind of feeling of certainty that this, this guy is an expert. He knows exactly what's going to happen. So when we gave these kind of questions to students who had courses in statistics, they suggested, many of them, that the wide intervals was associated with lower rather than higher confidence interval. So for instance, when we, when we said, well, here somebody has said 90% certainty and somebody has said something with 60% certainty, which interval is big, the larger one? And you got two completely different questions, answers. Most of them thought that the 90% interval must be a narrow one. So, the intervals have boundaries, of course. They have an upper boundary, they have a lower boundary. And in many cases, we think it is enough to use one of them. And I, like with the verbal probabilities, I will call one of these boundary positive and one of these boundary negative. And it may surprise you that I call the lower boundary positive. But it's not so surprising after all. These are words like it will minimum happen, it will at least happen, it will be over so and so, more than so, so it will be at least two degrees warmer and then you're pointing upwards, of course. Whereas the higher bound is negative because it's preceded with a word that is pointing downwards, like maximum, at most, under, less than. It will be at most five degrees warmer. Now this also says something pragmatic. Uh, think of the uh, of the projections I mentioned to you, and people said it can be five degrees warmer. And actually, they say exactly the same if they are asked to fill in, it will be maximum something, five degrees warmer. But we say it, is can, it can be five degrees warmer sounds quite alarming, whereas maximum five degrees warmer sounds much more reassuring. So these single bounds have pragmatic implications and they turn out to be the same as with the words. So the lower bound indicates largeness. If I just say more than something, it doesn't matter what it is more than, you understand that I'm going to say that something is big. I, I read in the uh, uh, FSI guidance notes that EFSA is publishing more than 500 publications a year. They could have said less than 600. <laughs> no. Or five to 600, they just said more than. And, and we are impressed, of course, we are impressed. <laughs> I would have been impressed with more than 300. Perhaps I wouldn't be impressed by more than two. By, <laughs> so there is a limit. An upper bound indicates that something is smaller than you expect. There is an asymmetry here because the more than statement, the lower bound statement, they are more common from various reasons you can imagine. And they are also a little bit more neutral. It's more obvious that you mean something particularly strange when you have this less than thing. But in the same way as with the other words, they reveal attitudes, concerns, recommendations, and warnings. They also reveal that there may be a trend here. We have studied something that we call the trend effect. If we have, two, if we have revised our um, estimates of something, so it's no higher than it used to be. We are no more certain than we used to be, etc. 
people immediately think this will go on. Next time you will be even more certain. But you don't need, even need two statements to infer a trend. It's enough with one single statement. If you say it is more than 60% certain that we will have a uh, five degrees in the future or whatever, people will immediately think that it used to be less. Now it's more than. It will be even higher in the future. Uh, to just uh, to show you a little bit uh, of result, this is just a Google count uh, to show that also with probabilities we say more than and less than. And if we search in, Go in uh, Google News, how many times do people say more than 50 percent? Very often that is in the, in the middle, the red ones. Um, how many times do they say more than 60%? Well, they say at least, and these are the red ones, uh, they say uh, it quite often, 320 times they say more than 60%. They never say less than 60%. So less than, these are the blue ones. Uh, less than is usually used with small Probabilities are not just small, they are less than small. And high probabilities with positive terms. Uh, there is more. You see also there are more reds and blues. Not so very different, but it shows that uh, more than is a more common expression, at least with probabilities. So, maybe I should come to the conclusions. So these two themes, all, all possible themes I have studied, uh, both verbal probabilities and interval bounds have similar pragmatic implications. They are not neutral. They have a positive or a negative directionality in the sense that they direct the recipient's attention and sort of leak information also about which way is it going. They tell you something about what you believe or what you are concerned about. And even if you are not really believing it or concerned about it, your readers will think, will attribute some beliefs to you. And therefore, it also functions as warnings and recommendations. They are not completely symmetric. We have something in psychology also called the negativity effect, that whenever you, you, you are negating something, then you are sort of saying something less in a less neutral way. It will also be uh, given more attention and people will think about it. But we have to know the context because they are not always chosen freely. Sometimes it is just a response to what somebody else has said or uh, some, something you have been asked about, and then they don't have these additional meanings, maybe. But this is, of course, my uh, idea, final idea, that science communicators and the public, of course, should know the interplay between words and number and the power of this apparently neutral or innocent terms like more or less. And just as a kind of conclusion, not just uh, for what I have been saying, but perhaps for the whole conference, I get the feeling that these quotes are appropriate. It's a quote by Lord Kelvin that you may know. When you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager an unsatisfactory kind, he said. But then the economist Jack Weiner said, when you can measure it, when you can express it in numbers, your knowledge is still all a meager <laughs> and unsatisfactory kind. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, Professor Teigen. We have time for questions. Yes, and of course, on the bottom, they, were, they should have been in Norwegian. <laughs> well, they are collected in, in, in Norway and in England, but this is sort of basic things in, in language. And I have, a, I have a colleague in Japan, for instance, who have collected some similar data. Uh, I, so I, I don't see any real strong difference. We had a problem with can because in, in Norwegian we have only can for may and, uh, and could, etc. So we had to use specific experiments uh, with uh, English speakers with could and may, and there's no difference in this pragmatic side. There could be uh, th th differences when it comes to the, kind, the, high, the strength of the probability that they say something about. But, at least until somebody uh, proves the contrary, I think it is very general. Thank you. Is there another question? Yes, over there. You have to keep the button turned. Sorry. Yeah, now it's working better. Thank you. Um, um, we had a recently a discussion in our group about two words, likely versus prob probable. And in an, a German sense, it's sometimes difficult to discern these two expressions. And I would love to see from a mathematical point of view, maybe, whether there is a possibility of a distinction of these two. Because if it's something probable, it seems to be of high probability, in a way. Uh, if something is likely, it's not, not really unlikely that, that it will happen. So it's there is a certain chance of likelihood there. And there's a perception, maybe, also. If something is likely happening, then it's, it's something nearly to certain hap certainly happening. So for, for, for me, these two expressions are still a little bit confusing. Well, for, for, from the studies in English, I have seen people don't distinguish. Uh, or they, if they distinguish, it's very little. We have the same problem in Norwegian, uh, like wahrscheinlich or, or uh, sandsynly in Norwegian. Uh, so we have to use uh, that word for both these terms. And I don't think it makes a difference. Also, the opposite, this is an example of asymmetric, actually, because unlikely or improbable is not just the reverse of probable. The way people are using it is that they say something is unlikely, we can forget about it. It has almost no chance of, of happening. Even if they tr seem to translate it like, 20% probability, but they don't really mean it. Uh, it is just because we give them some numbers that they should. So, but when we ask them to fill in sentences, it is unlikely that it will be how many degrees warmer? They don't say five degrees warmer. They say 10 degrees warmer, or something that is sort of out of the range. And that's the same thing for unlikely and improbable. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Would like to ask another question? No. There, oh, there are two. The, okay, we take them both. Gentleman first, and then the lady. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Xiao Chen from University of Surrey. And I have one question regarding to the use of the verbal probability and the the numerical intervals. And do you think it's possible or it's necessary to uh, build a bridge between the verbal uh, probability and uh, the numerical interval? Because 
for the scientist, for scientists, we normally use the, the numbers because it's more robust and it's more scientific. But for decision maker, for example, they prefer to use these linguistic terms to use that. So uh, you mentioned about the translation between them, and do you think we? Uh, it's an interesting topic to have some tr um, consistent translation between these both terms. Thank you. You mean uh, translation from uh, the verbal to the uh, yeah exactly to the, to the, the interval range, uh, thing. Uh, that's an interesting question. I haven't. I, I have no. Uh, well, to to save you time, I say I, I will say I don't know. <laughs> But I'll That's think fair. about it. <laughs> very quick, very quick last question from the lady above. Thank you. So I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I'm a statistician. So for me, like when you talk about the uncertain interval, the width of the uncertain interval is completely independent from the confidence level you want to have. But I. I was surprised that for general public that it's actually um, related that people associate narrow uncertainty interval with certain, but they, they, they ignore the term confidence. And it's the same for me for the picture you choose for the climate change and for the rise of the sea level. And for me, I wouldn't choose the top most value, but I was shocked when you talk about people would choose that value. Just, just a strange feeling for me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this feeling with us. Uh, thank yeah. you, Professor Toygen, for this very interesting talk.